service, I'm over here. I'm a bit of doing two jobs this morning, but that's okay. Um, we're going to start by singing a good old carol, O Come All You Faithful. So would you stand and sing with us? as we continue to sing.
Well, like I said before, good morning and also Merry Christmas. It's so great to see you all here. Um, whether you've stepped inside this building for the first time today or you come here regularly, we are so excited to be able to celebrate this amazing day with you all. Now, I don't know about you, but ever since I was little, I have had this kind of inexplicable joy every year on the 25th of December. As I've gotten a bit older, and some of you may say I'm still pretty young, but as I've gotten a bit older, I think the days leading up to Christmas become a bit more normal. But Christmas Day is always special. And maybe because it's because of the sound of my bell on the stocking um, as it jingles when I wake up in the morning, or the sight of all the presents under the tree, or maybe it's because the thing that we celebrate every year at Christmas, the birth of Jesus Christ, is so incredibly joyous. And the Bible actually tells us that when the angels first told people about the birth of Jesus, they said these words, I am bringing you good news. It will be a joy to all people. Today, your Savior was born in David's town. He is Christ the Lord. Now, maybe for some of you, this Christmas isn't an incredibly happy one. I think this year has left many of us feeling exhausted, fed up, and just plain weary. Um, but this morning, we get to sing to read about and to pray to a God who brings inexplicable, unending joy in the midst of a world like ours. So now, Sybil is going to come up to us and read to us from the Bible passages which tell us of this amazing news of great joy. Thanks, Sybil. Morning, everyone. I'm reading two passages this morning. The first one is from Isaiah, and you can follow with the words on the screen. And then I'll be reading from the New Testament from Luke about the birth of Jesus. So the first one is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and, and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and evermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And the next reading is from Luke chapter 2. Verses 1 to 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. On. Good. The weary world rejoices. That's the uh, line from a carol, from the carol, O Holy Night. It's been on all of our advertising and it just seems so apt for this year, doesn't it? It has been a weary year. 
Remember in March this year, as we started hearing the news of the spread of the virus and the fact that it was now being acknowledged to be something that was at the levels of a pandemic. Uh, and we were trying to work out as a church how we can respond properly and every time we'd work it out, the Premier would get on that night and throw all our ideas in the bin because suddenly the new stuff, the restrictions that were in place meant we had to go further. It was a hard journey, wasn't it? And then people had to do things like learning online. Uh, I, I don't know who liked that. I don't know many teachers who liked it, that's for sure. We had to work from home. We got all of those frustrations that came with the virus. I mean, you think about it. It wasn't just the virus itself. There were job losses. There was the isolation that people experienced as they uh, had to stay in their homes. And particularly the people who were in, uh, in, in nursing homes who couldn't be visited. There was something quite tragic in that, wasn't there? We saw separation, people living on uh, different sides of the state boundaries that have been closed. My parents, uh, I, I was supposed to be catching up with the family last year for Christmas and the bushfires got in the way. Supposed to be catching up this year for Christmas and they can't come up here because they're, they live in Sydney and now they're Mexicans and we don't let the Mexicans in. We've seen restriction. People have had their plans to travel, to move, to e enjoy this year and all those plans went in the bin because you're not allowed to travel. And, and we've seen recklessness, haven't we? The, the people who refuse to uh, abide by the um, restrictions that have been placed on us for our own good. People who've snuck across borders. People who've lied about their symptoms. We've seen a recklessness that makes us weary. As I said the other night at Carol's, it, it does make me feel sorry for anyone whose name actually is Karen. Because uh, they, they, such, such people ended up with this nickname being Karens. But there we go. But it's not just being coronavirus this year. As I said, we, we, we kicked off the year with fire. Uh, bushfires that went through our country. It, it just seems like an eternity ago now, doesn't it? But this time last year, Australia was burning. And do you remember how the fires ended? They ended in floods. <laughs> Uh, people who'd had so much loss through fire then had to, hit, uh, to deal with floods. That's a wonderful picture of a poor little koala perched on top of a fence post, looking very bedraggled. I found that online. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, we've watched this year as international tensions, particularly between Australia and China, have escalated. Who's been watching that on the news? And it's funny, actually, because uh, although Queensland had an election, it got overshadowed by an election that none of us got to vote in because it seemed that the US election was a, a pretty big thing. I had, uh, saw online that somebody had posted um, a, a little comment saying, you know, um, at least Joe Biden can't be as bad as Donald Trump. And I really hope history doesn't prove that person wrong because, let's face it, We've seen that you can do worse than bad. It just does leave us weary. Weary of the kind of things that we get blasted with. Weary of the strife and the trouble that occurs between people. Weary of stupidity. Weary of our world and its ills. Now, it's been great news to know that the vaccine has been developed and is being distributed. 
Uh, I don't think anyone begrudges the United States for having quite a lot of doses going out there. They have got a stupid number of cases and a stupid number of deaths. But even if the vaccine goes out, it can't stop the weariness of a world full of mess and full of human mess. Whilst the, a, 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 a vaccine may do something about a virus, some of the underlying problems, the things that meant that during lockdown, domestic violence rose markedly, that's an indicator of a problem that isn't going to be solved by a vaccine. The fact that we saw people with a as long as it's okay for me, as long as my world gets minimally adjusted, I don't care what happens to anybody else. We've seen that through this virus, as people have taken up that attitude. That's why we ran out of toilet paper in March. That's not going to get solved by a vaccine. There is something at work in our world that just makes us weary and longing for hope in a weary world. This morning, I want to draw your attention to one of the passages that Sybil read for us. It was a promise, a promise that was delivered at a time of great weariness. That's why it began with this phrase, a people walking in darkness. In the first couple of verses of Isaiah 9, you might remember Sybil started at verse 2, but uh, it, it talks about a couple of places in the, in, at the beginning there. Naphtali and Zebulun. They're occupied cities. See, for this people, their weariness wasn't a virus. It was war. It was international conflict. Domestic conflict. See, they, they had trouble with... a. a Superpower, that sounds unusual. We've not had any of that of late, have we? They had trouble with a superpower who were now actually camped in their country. And that's those places, Naphtali and Zebulun. They just they had an enemy army in them. They were in strife with their more local neighbours. Their nearby, nearby countries were at war with them. Their own um, flesh and blood, they their they're, they're, if you like, there was interstate rivalry with hard border closures. We've never heard of that either. And they were weary. And they're described here as a people walking in darkness, living in a land of deep darkness, because it wasn't just what they were experiencing. It was what they were doing. This was a, a people who belonged to God yet ignored Him. A people who belonged to God yet spent their time devoted to alternatives to the God who had given them everything. This was a people in darkness. And yet, the way this passage begins is by saying that the background of bleak darkness is something that gets pierced by an incredible warming light. People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. On those dwelling in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. Here is hope. This is a hope that is like a blinding light in the dark, stunning us with its brilliance. And the hope is something that addresses what sits under all of those things that make us weary, that made them weary back then, that make us weary today. The conflict that is at work in us and between us. The conflict that leads us to say, me first. The conflict that leads us to do things that are ugly. We see that conflict played out internationally. We see that conflict played out in our own homes. Verses 4 and 5, the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of 
oppressor you've broken as of the day of Midian, every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. You're getting the picture? This is a people who are at, who, who are, war is there. There are occupied cities, there are prisoners, there are people under the boot of warriors. Because the conflict that exists between people is just such a part of human experience. But the day is coming, says this prophet, when all of it ends. When the conflict is over. When the whole, all the trappings of conflict are gone. When the fights are no more. When the rivalries are no more. And isn't that a day we yearn for? When I was growing up, um, I remember one particular Christmas um, where, well, it, it didn't go so well. Anybody had that experience? You turn up to a big family Christmas event and it actually turns into a big family squabble? Anybody had it? Or is it just me? Just me, okay, fine. We did, we, we turned up, and you know, I, you know, it was one of my relatives and another one of my relatives were arguing about who'd brought what. And the whole thing ended in fumes and fury. And isn't it sad that that kind of conflict is always at work, always staining things, and doesn't it leave you yearning? Yearning for an end, not just to international conflict, but to all conflict. Doesn't it leave you yearning for that thing that we talk about at this time of year, peace on earth? I find it very interesting as I go around shops, uh, places that are very adamant, like, uh, you know, you go into Westfield and it wants to do the, you know, it's Happy Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. Um, I remember somebody saying, you know, you can't call it, you can't say Happy Christmas because that offends people who aren't Christian. You can't say Happy Hanukkah because that offends people who aren't Jewish. You can't say Happy Holidays, that offends people who aren't happy. Um, <laughs> you, you know, we, we, we try and just cover everybody, don't we? Lest anybody be offended. And yet, we see the trappings around this time of year, things that have come out of the Scriptures. This idea of peace on earth. It's put on cards. We, we see it, you know, you can buy little things to stick on your mantelpiece that say it. Because we yearn for it. We yearn for it. And here, it is promised that it will happen. And it's a promise that is wrapped up in what seems like an impossible mix. He says, for to us... A child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Here is where God's concern leads us. See, the Bible is quite clear that underneath all of that conflict is the major conflict, the one that we have with our Creator. We want to do it our way. That great song, I Did It My Way, captures our problem in a nutshell. We want to claim my life, my way. And I'm the most important person here. And once you get two people in a room who both think that, you've got a conflict. I don't know what that does with us now because we've got quite a lot of us. But it's, an, it, it's a deeply ingrained way of looking at the world and we, we're all kind of infected with it a bit. And yet God's response to this, God's passionate response, is not what I would do. See, when there's conflict... When it's resolved, I want people to know I won. I know that's pretty petty, isn't it? But that's my inclination. 
I want to be clear that even if we find a peaceful solution, I kind of won. And yet, what does God's zeal lead him to? It leads him to provide a way out for us. A way out for those in darkness. A way out for those in conflict. Yet, how does this way out work? There, there's, if you miss it in there, there's, there's a lot of language about rule. Now, I know we don't really do a lot with royalty uh, here in Australia. Mostly, the purpose of royalty is to sell magazines. Isn't that right? We, we keep a royal family in England so that New Idea and uh, Women's Weekly will have something to print on their pages. And that seems to be to a large extent, the Australian interaction with royalty. Yet the idea behind a kingship is the one who takes up, who champions the people. And that's where we've been so grieved by leaders. It's why we watched elections with such an ache in our hearts. Because in the end, we've learned that terrible lesson that actually the scriptures talk about that you do not put your trust in princes when we see people who take up positions of leadership whether you call them a president a prime minister or a king we see how broken they are and we realize that actually they're as broken as we are just with a lot more influence and we yearn for a king who gets it right don't we we yearn for somebody who can take up our cause, champion the cause of people right, properly, in a way that actually enriches, not them personally, not just a way that they can get a better Twitter profile. And here a kingdom is promised that is established in justice and righteousness forever. This is about a promise that's been right through the Bible of, a, of God's King who will actually make things right, who will do it right. They call Him the, the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. And this King who does it right... The thing that's unusual about this king is, is how long he actually reigns for. Now, uh, we, we have our, Queen Elizabeth has actually been now on, I believe, on the throne for longer than Queen Victoria was. That's right, isn't it? Um, as somebody wrote on, a, uh, on an exam paper um, that Queen Victoria was the longest queen uh, because she sat on a thorn for 63 years. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, we, we've got a, a longer queen. Yet, this is somebody whose reign lasts forever. How do you do that? This is an even bigger picture because we look for a king and, 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 and the people who heard these promises looked for somebody to, who would fulfill them. Who, what kind of person are they going to be like? And they'd created their pictures of it. One of the things that this passage says that's going to be characteristic of this king is that he's, he's going to be incredible. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. That's not a normal king. This is the one who is actually the king of the universe. This is the one who made all things. This is God with us. This is where the Lord of the universe actually comes into the world he has made, gets involved, gets his hands dirty in order to be the king we need. And yet, this mighty God, whose rule lasts forever, whose ruling right is a baby. For to us, a, a child is born, a, a, a son is... It looks like an impossible mix. 
I don't know how many babies were born this year. I confessed last night that I probably could have looked it up. I didn't look it up after I got home last night, just in case you're wondering. Though the number of babies that are special who were born this year is exactly the same number as the number who were born this year, isn't it? You show me a person who doesn't think the baby is. is. They are. Glorious. Wonderful. Yet the child who is promised here leaves all of those special babies in the dust. This is... This takes special to whole new levels. This is unique in history. This is why one baby born 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world still has us celebrating here today. Something that has occurred, the birth of a baby has occurred so many times over that period of time and yet this one baby has the whole world celebrating even today. Because in this child that is promised, we find the reason for a weary world to rejoice. Because in this child, we see an end to conflict. Jesus born... See, we have this wonderful perspective. In the passage from Isaiah that Sybil read, everything's looking forward They're currently in darkness and in war. And there's this window of hope on the distant horizon and a seemingly impossible mix. Yet in the second reading from Luke's Gospel, we find that hope actually happening right there and then. And we sit here 2,000 years later looking back at it. This is a matter now of history. It has happened. God has entered this world His king has been born. Jesus, who is the mighty God, God with us, has come among us. And what's more, that Jesus grew and dealt with the thing that sits under everything. So that Jesus brings the promise of an end to conflict. That's why he is the Prince of Peace. He brings an end to conflict, to the conflict that so mars our world. He brings an end to sickness. Hallelujah for that. In a way no vaccine can ever do. He brings an end to broken relationships and the stain that we feel from them. Because all of these things are are just an outworking of the sickness, the malady that has been in our world since its beginning. I don't know what today has in store for you. For most of us, uh, it's a joyful day, but maybe for some of us, it's a hard day. A sad day. Maybe as you gather this Christmas the empty chair is going to be a very significant one at your table. The one that used to be occupied. Christmas can be a time when we're reminded of the reality of death. But all of that comes in the same bundle. In rejecting God, these are the consequences. This is how it works out. As we say, me first, not you, that conflict then builds and grows and spreads and we get the mess of our world and Jesus came to actually deal with all of it. So that in the end, there is no death. There is no conflict. There is no sickness. There is no broken relationship because there is no sin. And that is the beautiful news that is the ray of light that shines through the darkness that is the glorious hope that leaves us rejoicing despite our weariness all it took was this one baby not any baby but God with us who grew who died, who rose, 
and who is coming back. The one who has dealt with sin and on whose return the consequences of sin will be no more. I love the way that the Bible ends. In chapter 21 of Revelation, it says this, the great promise that is to come. Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with us. He will dwell with them, they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall be, there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore because the old order of things has passed away. Isn't that light in a dark world? Isn't that a cause for a weary world to rejoice? And that hope is all bound up in God with us, the one whose birth we celebrate today. So as you go home and you do whatever it is that you do on Christmas Day, every one of us has probably got slightly different traditions of how we do these things. Remember why we do what we do. Remember the glorious hope that pierces the darkness of a weary world. And give thanks to the God who brings an end to this conflict through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that you don't respond to us by rejecting us. You respond to us by giving us a gift of incredible joy and beauty. You come among us to take up our cause rightly with justice. You, God, with us. We thank you that in Jesus Christ, in his birth, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, we see an end to sin and to conflict and to sickness and to death. And we yearn for the day when that which Jesus has achieved is experienced throughout our world. And all of those things are distant memories of a day long past. This Christmas, as we rejoice together, fix our eyes on the reason we have to rejoice in this weary world. Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. And we are going to sing um, to that amazing newborn king.
one of the joys of knowing and trusting in Jesus, this newborn king who we celebrate today, is knowing that he is the only one who can fix the mess of this world and our imperfection. Um, and it's, it's important to come before God and acknowledge where we fail to meet his perfect standards so that we can rest in his perfection. So let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. So let's confess our sins together, saying, Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The amazing news is that God desires that none should perish, but that all should actually turn to Christ and live. In response to his call, we acknowledge our sins, and God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. And through that, we can have peace with God through Jesus. God's mercy is great, and he has loved us very much. We were spiritually dead because of the things that we did wrong against God, but God gave us new life in Christ. We have been saved by God's grace. Such amazing news. And we are actually going to continue our time of prayer now as Anne comes to lead us. Thank you, Anne. Will you join with me? And our eyes at last shall see him through his own redeeming love. For that child, so dear and gentle, is our Lord in heaven above. And he leads his children on to the place where he is gone. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of the fact that the child whose birth we celebrate today is indeed our Lord in heaven above. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and we are so privileged to know him as our Saviour. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you willingly came to earth as a human being in order to open heaven up to all those who ask you to be their saviour. Thank you too that your plan didn't stop there and it hasn't stopped to this day. As our Lord in heaven above, you are out in front leading on your people, those who have become children of God because of your own redeeming love and you're leading them on to the place where you have gone. What joy there will be on that day when our eyes at last shall see you, dear Lord and Saviour of us all. Praise to your glorious name. Dear Lord, this Christmas there are many people who are facing life without someone they loved. We pray for them in their grief. Help them to be comforted by those same words that you are leading your children on to the place where you have gone. Across the world, with the pandemic raging in many countries, there are people facing the fear of their or their loved one's death. Father, turn up the volume on these words so that they ring loudly in their ears and lead them through the shadow of death. Help them to see that their good shepherd lies just ahead and will watch over them. Help them to look to him and to follow him with confidence and hope. May the Lord in heaven above have many reasons to also rejoice this Christ Christmas with many people choosing to follow Jesus. More than anything, Lord, we thank you for the speed with which vaccines have been developed and we ask you that you will grant that a just and equitable distri distribution 
will happen for all people everywhere in 2021. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, we can't help but be troubled when our TV show us places like Yemen and Syria and Africa where war is an even greater threat than COVID. It's exposed myriads of vulnerable people to homelessness, famine, disease and starvation. We pray that you will raise up world leaders who will be determined to share the resources of a richer nation with those in need. And help us to do our part, Lord, being as generous as we can to appeals for help and not turning our faces away from the needs of others. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask you to be with our friends who are in nursing homes this Christmas. Thank you too for the many organisations who are serving up meals to the poor and homeless to let them know that they're not alone and they're not forgotten, but because of Jesus, they are loved and valued. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, we pray for governments right across Australia to use their powers to restrain wickedness and to promote an Australia that gives a fair go to everyone. Give them wisdom to tackle the problems of domestic violence, climate changes, how to use our resources, our justice and medical systems that too often are too expensive for ordinary Australians, and how to care for the aged. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so this Christmas Day, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the blessings that we enjoy as Australians. But above all, we thank you for our Saviour Jesus Christ and his redeeming love buying us back from our sin-induced death by willingly taking our place and offering us instead eternal life. Help us to look past the baby to the Lord in heaven above, leading us on to the place where he has gone, to the place where at last our eyes shall see him. Amen. Would you join with me in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, in a moment, we're going to be singing our final song. Um, but I would like to encourage you, if you do want to know more about Jesus or about St. John's as a church, or just want to chat a bit more about Christmas, um, come and chat to me or any of the people that you've seen up front this morning. We would be more than happy to talk to you or even just exchange contact information so we can chat sometime after this crazy day. Um, but would you pray with me once more before we sing together? All glory to you, gracious God, for the gift of your Son, whom you sent to save us. With the angels, let us praise your name and tell the earth his story, that all may believe, rejoice, and proclaim your love through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now would you stand and sing with us about this incredible joy of the birth of Jesus.
After this season is over, the Christmas lights come down and the wrapping paper goes in the bin and the Christmas music no longer plays on the radio, we may ask, what happens next? The wonder and awe of Christmas is just a beginning. Christmas reminds us that the baby born in Bethlehem has given us purpose and joy for living and what happens next to us largely depends on how we embrace our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and follow him. So Merry Christmas, everyone. Have a safe and happy holiday as you remember God's amazing gift that gives this weary world reason to rejoice. <laughs>